Welcome to Innovating Leadership, Co-Creating Our Future. I'm your host, Maureen Metcalf, CEO and founder of the Innovative Leadership Institute. I am delighted today to be joined by Tammy Alvarez. She is one of our strategic partners and the CEO and founder of Career Winner Circle, a comprehensive collection of coaching and training programs designed to strengthen leaders to grow their careers quickly and sustainably. Leaders should treat their careers like a business that they become the CEO of. So Tammy's going to talk about what that change looks like. Tammy, welcome. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. I appreciate the invitation. You've had a fascinating career. What got you to living in Belize and running the Career Leader Circle? I started my career in Wall Street and I loved it. I was there for 30 years and throughout my career, I kept getting promoted. I was a transformation expert. So whenever something was broken, me and my team would just run in and fix it. And fortunately, in financial services, there's always a crisis. So there was always something that I could be excited about. I remember very specifically, because I'd been always energized by my career. I've led 2,000 people, 36 countries, massive budgets, tons of patents. I mean, we've done some really cool things, and I've loved it. And then I remember sitting in my office one day, coming out of a board meeting after a quarterly earnings report. And I just sat in my office and I'm like, I hate this. All of the things that I had worked so hard for that were so important to me, one day, like this no longer serves me. But then it took me about two years to really get out of what I call the guilt trap, the loyalty to my company, the loyalty to my team, you know, the loyalty to our customers and our brand and the, the strategy that I was driving. It's like, if I leave now, everything is going to fail. It's all going to be my fault. All of those things were things as a leader that I had to unwind. One day, the world came together and it all worked for me. My daughter was graduating college, so she was off the payroll. My big, fancy, expensive apartment in New York City that Lisa was coming to. So I'm like, oh, I can pull the plug on this. And I decided it's time to do something different. I am not a small bet kind of girl. I've never been that. I like big risks. I like big challenges. It helps me stay vibrant and alive. So me and my partner decided, let's leave the country. And so we did. So I cashed out of my Wall Street job, moved to a tropical island in Central America. We're on a little island off the coast of Belize. I started this executive coaching and career strategy firm five years ago. Really what our sweet spot is comes from my own personal experiences and my own passion in that I remember dreading the minute my eyes open, looking at my phone, looking at the emails and being, I cannot survive this stupidity another minute. Or like my boss that was just completely crazy and looking at like him blowing up my phone before 6 a.m. And I'm like, oh, this is insane. And I remember feeling stuck. And I remember feeling like I didn't have options. That is really from a career strategy perspective, where our solutions and where our passion comes from. Because when you're a highly successful, adaptable, and ambitious leader, it's easy to find yourself stuck in a career you don't love and not know how to get out. The headspace that happens with that is pretty intense. Like, oh, there's guilt. Because it's like, well, at this age, I should have it all figured out by now. I am in the C-suite. How come I don't know this? Or how did I let this happen? Um, so there's a lot of things that happen to people really that are talented that gets them stuck. And so we are all about helping our clients get unstuck and step into things that now serve them. And the fun part is the adventure is different for everyone. Where they end up is different for everyone. And that's always fun when you apply your secret sauce and see what happens for them. One of the things that you and I talked about that I thought was really important about your work is that often when people feel stuck, it's partially they've got financial commitments. Yeah. Now you happen to be able to move to a tropical island. Not everyone can. Part of what you do that I think is important for listeners to think about is the assumption that when I leave this big role, I'm going to take a big financial hit doesn't have to be true. Correct. It's finding the right use of these brilliant skills in an environment that may not require a lot of work before six in the morning. Right. And here's the secret sauce, because you're 100% right about this, Maureen. I saw a survey, I think it was Harvard Business Review, but don't quote me. It was something insane, like 85% of people over 45 years old hated their job. It's a huge number of people who are just, you know, slogging every day. One of the biggest reasons people stay where they don't want to be is because they can't sell everything and live in a yurt. They do feel like, I can't make this money. I can't replicate this. I can't do these things. 
And on average, with what we've seen for the past three years, we've had about 150 people come through this program. Our clients are making on average 20% more doing something they've never done before. This is just blowing everybody's mind. Like, how does that happen? But here's the secret sauce, especially for mid to senior level leaders is when you think about the things that light you up and you think about the things that really bring a high value to the organizations in general, and like that's your sweet spot, right? That's your zone of genius, whatever you want to call it. That's really where you want to stay. But then you find industries, you find organizations where your natural talents aren't organically available in that organization, but that are also in high demand and in short supply. Because when you can do that, now you are highly sought after and you start to get paid for what you know, not for what you do. And that increases your income. And I'll give you a perfect example. I've got a client, not going to mention any names, a big corporate client that for the first time ever is going through financial difficulties. And it's a big publicly traded company. Everyone who grew up in this company has always been in a land of abundance. Had a problem, throw more money at it. More work, add more people. Like that's just if you grew up in this organization, that's all you know. And now that economic headwinds are here, they've you know recently IPO'd, they're not making money. No one knows how to lead through cost cutting. No one knows how to go from a decentralized organizational model to a centralized organizational model without having chaos. No one knows how to structure legal entities and things to get better reporting. And so for people who have those skills, can go into an industry that they have never been in before and make significantly more money and make that impact, which is what we're all here for, because now you're helping show people the way where the stakes are high and the visibility is high and the work is fun. It just breaks my heart when I see people who are stuck because they think they have to take a step back. And the reason they think that is because they're right. When you do it wrong, you do take a step back. There's a million case studies where people have taken big pay cuts. But when you do it right, and you don't show up like an outsider and you really find that market niche where your skills are in high demand and in short supply, all of a sudden things change very quickly for you. For companies who are trying to retain their people, because that's hard right now. I mean, people are moving around, you know, the great resignation and remote work is just causing chaos everywhere. And let's, you know, the headwinds with all kinds of craziness going on right now. The more companies can be agile and flex and give talented people the room to run, to learn, to grow, and to contribute beyond organizational lines and hierarchy chart, you're really going to be able to keep those people engaged. There's a lot of ways for people to grow. And I think that's really important for companies to think about beyond the typical, here's your career path, here's your competency models, here's all your other HR stuff. It's like, how do we let people flex on the fly, right? Grow and run and be able to add that additional value that they want to add because that's going to help people continue to earn and it's going to keep them there for people who are trying to stay where they are because they've got the big houses and the big toys and maybe a couple exes or kids in college or whatever. That's not true. You don't have to do that. I love that you talked about also what's happening on the corporate side. Okay. As we think about the career life cycle and the leadership life cycle, the idea that how we lead while the fundamentals are the same, we still set corporate direction and strategy and execute delivering, the tactics we use and the mindset significantly is changing. How I engage with my team, if they're primarily remote, will be different from a mindset perspective and how do I think about even connecting and relating and communicating mm -hmm. for the organization, thinking about how are we providing appropriate flexibility? How are we helping our leaders build agility? What needs to happen in our corporate structuring and recognition programs and career pathing so that folks who want to be remote don't feel like they'll be penalized and have to leave? Right. Let's take this one step further and be really controversial because the gig economy has a massive groundswell right now. People that want to do portfolio work or that don't want to do the same thing all the time every day are willing to bail on the benefits, pick up a couple projects and do that. But what if you could have a gig economy inside your own organization? Like what if you didn't have these arcane rules that say you've got to sit in your role for two years before you can make a move. Companies that want to be innovative, that trust that work gets done, even if you don't see it, and that, you know, really wants to hire the best and brightest talent, but not put them in boxes once you do, then those are the companies that are going to grow. 
those are the companies that are going to retain the best talent, attract the best talent and those types of things. So I always encourage organizations to like, just if you could throw everything away, look at our new normal, because it's not going back to the way it was, right? We all know that it's only moving forward. What would that look like? How do you structure that? And, you know, so how do you give enough guardrails so people feel like they've got a place, but you've got enough bandwidth and breadth where people can actually flex where they need to go? You know, there's just fun things to talk about that I don't see any organizations having the courage to actually do quite yet. I co-wrote a chapter in a book, Leadership 2050, several years ago with a futurist, and she was talking about VUCA, so volatile, uncertain, chaotic, and ambiguous. We were exchanging messages a couple of days ago, and she said, we're in full on VUCA now, and I'm not sure what role I want to play in this current world because it's different. And, you know, for a lot of people, that's the question is, it's just not fun anymore Part of it is we're trying to maintain the same structures in a different landscape. You know, it's fish walking across the beach or something. It just doesn't work. I think a lot of leaders haven't yet relinquished the view that this is how things are done because that's how everybody does it. And so how do we let go of some of our conventional thinking and put new things in place so we can still accomplish our mission? Because we don't get to run up costs and be stupid and go out of business. We've got to deliver the product. And so the people who show up every day still have things to deliver and they still want to get paid and they still want tools and equipment and collaboration and all of that. And our clients still want the same or better services. So I appreciate your point. It takes a lot of courage for leaders in this new context to really rethink and experiment with, not necessarily throw everything out on day one, but what's our smallest division and how do we experiment with new approaches to leadership there, not across an enterprise of hundreds of thousands of people? The balance of power, for lack of a better term, has changed Mm -hmm. for a very long time. Like the employers held all the cards. Right. I mean, that's very much still the JP Morgan model, right? You come to the office every day, you do your thing the way we tell you to, or you you have to go for big companies. Okay. That's your choice. But success and the definition of success changes over time for companies and for individuals. And so I think to continually to check in and say, okay, where my goalposts were two years ago, three years ago, what I thought was important to me, how I define success, how I feel proud when I talk about my accomplishments. The things that got you fired up may not be the things that get you fired up now, but you don't change. You just keep going down the same path. And then you wonder why you feel disenfranchised and confused. And I hate every Monday I get, right? You get that Sunday blues kicking in. But yet when you're constantly taking stock, and this is where becoming that CEO of your career comes in handy, because when you're looking at your career like a business, you're always resetting your goals. I mean, I'm in the middle of forecasting with my team and looking about, okay, you know, what does next year look like? What's happening in the market? Where's the demand for our services? Where are we going to double down on in terms of the way we're going to approach next year? But no one does that with their career. So from that perspective, if you did that, then you would always be taking stock and saying, okay, this is my next thing. And it doesn't have to be a significant shift in terms of a job change or anything like that. It could just be, I'm bored doing this and I want to take on a different project. Or I'm so sick of leading this team because there's nothing more I can do for them. I just want to go lead a different team, right? Same company, just give me a lateral and let's grow in place. When people take that CEO mindset, a few things happen. You start to really reassess on a consistent basis and adjust. You look at the headwinds and the opportunity and you see where your assets and your value is. And you're like, hang on a second. We have an industry disruptor. Our company is a hot mess. We can't compete, but I'm really good at innovation. So how about I leave the job I'm in right now within the organization and go help innovate so we stand a chance against our industry disruptor. But people don't think about things in terms of their career. They wait to get tapped. My good work will get recognized and, you know, they count on that. And that's a pipe dream. We all know that. Well, at least we should. The other thing from a CEO perspective that drives me crazy is that so many people take on additional work for no additional compensation. Now, in a corporate world, that's called scope creep. If you're working with a client and all of a sudden like, oh, I've got like 600 things for you to do that we didn't talk about. Still good? We're going to be like, no, (laughs) not still good. We can do this, but it's going to cost you more money. And if you're in that corporate mindset, 
you don't think about that. You just keep taking on more and more and more. And then companies wonder why all of a sudden you're disenfranchised and you decide to leave. So there's just these mindset things that don't take a lot of difference because we're used to running businesses. And so when you just start to treat your own career like a business and you run the same filters that you do every day at work, only more introspectively, then things start to show up differently for you and you start to make much more progress and you have a lot less frustration when you do that. Your CEO of your own company, how are you doing this for yourself? I, I hear we're planning for next year corporately. How is Tammy doing this for Tammy as CEO? I'm always taking stock on what energizes me because, you know, as a CEO, you have to do a lot of different things. Some things I have to do that doesn't give me energy, like finances and social media. I find both of those things soul crushing, but necessary. And I have other things that, you know, I do love to do, like coach and help clients figure things out. And I could do that for 12 hours a day and never be tired. And so as I'm building this business, I always look at, okay, what lights me up? Because if I can spend as much of my day doing the things that I'm excited about, bring in other team members to do the things that I am no longer excited about, but they are, then all of a sudden we're in massive growth mode. So I think a perfect example is, you know, I've been doing most of the coaching within this organization since we started. That's kind of how you get started. But I'm bringing in a few coaches over this past year to help pick up either clients that are better suited for someone else or the extra workload. But next year, we're hiring 10 new coaches. And so in 2023, the plan is we're bringing in coaches. They'll have their own portfolios. And they're going to be all very much like corporate executives moving into coaching because what lights me up now is growing a scalable business. So bringing in people who are so passionate about having their customers experience in terms of where they're moving with their career or leadership development, like that's going to be the fuel on the day to day. But for me, less coaching personally, but more building the business, adding more value and showing up bigger in terms of thought leadership and being able to really start to help companies get their heads wrapped around the complexities in terms of retention, empowerment, engagement, and all the things that they're just getting crushed on right now. So I'm always looking like, what do I love? Double down on that and find other people to do the stuff that I don't love anymore. So you do live it. I do. I do. I love all of it, but I love some things more than others, right? And so I love the coaching and I love the business development and I love helping other people grow. And so having coaches that want to build a practice and that want to really not just have this be an economically viable side hustle, but a legitimate sustainable business that lights me up. That's exciting for me because I know how much fun it is to leave corporate and I know how much fun it's not to be by yourself, right? I think that was one of the biggest transitions that I had a hard time with when I went from this giant corporate job where there was like a deli ticket outside my office. It was always a line outside my office every day to being by myself and like, okay, now what do I do? You know, because I'd never done anything like this before. So I did find some of the isolation as a solopreneur that was hard for me to deal with. I'm an extrovert, so I get my energy from other people. Surprise, surprise. So from that standpoint, those were hard adjustments for me. So what did I do? I found people. You know, I couldn't afford anyone yet, but I found a bunch of coaches that I could collaborate with. And we had accountability partners. And so I just surrounded myself with people that I knew I needed to get my energy from as I continued to figure out our path and really figure out how do we build an organization that is high, high value for any customer that comes through. So that's kind of how I navigate, because sometimes I feel like a five-year-old on a sugar high, right? And I'm just like, okay, so what's next? And what am I excited about? And so I want to make sure I always have the right people around me so I could do that. Beautiful. What is the biggest challenge leaders have when it comes to managing their careers? There's two things that show up pretty regularly in terms of, I think, the biggest challenges that they have. One that we started to talk about a little bit, and that's that loyalty trap. So in terms of, I feel very committed to my organization, my team, what we're doing, our customers, even if it no longer serves you. And even though you feel like you're in a soul crushing grind every single day, that loyalty is massive. And I'm not a psychologist and I don't play one on TV, but here's why I think this is. So many of us have a very big attachment to our sense of who we are with what we do. Speaking very much in the American culture, I know it's not like that everywhere, you know, but American culture specifically is very, very work focused because when you think about it, when you go to a party, what's the first thing someone asks? 
So what do you do? Right now, living in Belize, I got to tell you, no one cares what you do. We've traveled the world and no one cares. But in America specifically, like that's a big deal. We put so much stuff into identifying with what we do that when it finally doesn't feel right, it feels like a personal failure. And then we continue to just try and put more lipstick on it. I I spent two years unwinding that mess for myself personally as I was making this transition. So it's not easy. But when what you do is who you are or how you identify, to say that's no longer right is more than just a job change. I think that's why we're so loyal is because we're more loyal to our identity that has an association with our career than we are with the other things in our lives that light us up. Family, philanthropy, hobbies, things like that. American culture. So that's one. And I think it's hard to unpack that. And trying to do it by yourself is really hard. Let's face it. If it's hard, we're not going to do it, right? I mean, we're just not. We're just going to keep going until we like either get fired because we're no longer effective or we have a massive life event that requires something to change, right? From that perspective, I think that's one of the biggest things that people get jammed up in. So I would say if you start to get that pit in your stomach on Sunday or if you find yourself rolling your eyes and getting frustrated at that, you know, you can't make it a day without what am I doing here? Then it's time to start to do that work. You've already let it go too long. The other thing is time. I saw a study, I think it was on Indeed. Like I should write this stuff down because I'm, you know, I don't want to misquote anything. But it was insane. Like when I finally did the maths, they did a bunch of these analytics about how long it takes to find a new job. And the number was like 680 hours. I was like, oh my God, is that true? And so I started to back in. So I'm like, yeah, that sounds about right. If you're doing it by yourself or you don't know what you're doing. First of all, no one loves job hunting. I've never met anybody that said, I cannot wait to go find a new job, right? It's just soul crushing and everyone hates it. And then you add the time that it takes to do this well in already overly busy schedules. And then it's like, I don't have time, right? And so between it's easier to stay here because I'm loyal and I'm comfortable and I don't have time because this is going to take quite a bit of effort to make this happen. Unless you're in serious pain, you're not going to do anything. And so those are the things that I see so many people fall in the trap of. And with some guidance, and whether it's, you know, a coaching firm like ours, or whether it's a mentor, a friend, whatever, you can get through that a lot faster. The benefits on the upside are insane. And like, when you think about like, how would it feel to wake up on Monday mornings, excited to see what's in my email, to go to that meeting, you'd be like, I can't wait to hear what the team did last week. And so, you know, so many of us are just in this apathetic haze, or just completely disenfranchised and unplugged, and that we really do want to care, and we really do want to make an impact. But we make a lot of excuses to stay where we are and stay comfortable because it's really hard to make that transition. I'm working with a client now where many of their employees are 25-year-plus employees, almost every one of them, told me how many years they had left. Yeah. Nine years, 15 years, 18 years. They're counting down at more than a decade away. I know. And nobody fundamentally dislikes their work, but it's an interesting culture. I get counting, you know, I've got two years left, but 15, one of the things that strikes me is there is also prestige in some of the companies we work with. So who am I is an Accenture big consulting firm or McKinsey or Wall Street or investment banker, fill in the blank name. When I started my own company, like you, there was a, I'm not sure what I even say about myself. Like I'm CEO of my company. I'm CEO of myself. There are a whole bunch of people that I have no respect for who are CEOs of themselves. It's not like I can say I have this big job. I work in my pajamas some days. I don't actually work in my pajamas, but (laughs) you know, who am I? I've written a book, but a, a bunch of people, great people have written books. So have a bunch of people who's I wouldn't pay them to walk my dog and they've written books. So what is my identity as I'm in transition or as I start my own enterprise? Yeah, It is a fascinating exploration. And for me, that was also very difficult. What do I say when I go to an event when I don't even feel much confidence in what I'm doing? You know, my company name was my last name and associates. And everyone thought that was someone who had just lost a job and you took the easy path. And frankly, 20 years ago, that was true. But 20 years in, it was time to change the company name because it was still associated with, I just exited. The whole mental trap can be a quicksand. And I didn't have as much support as you offer your folks. And I think that is crucial. Yeah. 
Well, and one other thing that I think shows up for 100% of my clients, and it's just amazing, and we work with you know, a lot of people, mid to senior level leaders, is they don't know what they want to do next. So it's like, okay, I'm sitting here. I'm not happy. Making a lot of money, and it's you know either difficult or not that difficult, but either way, I don't love it. But I have no idea what I want to do next. And when you've got 10 to 15 years left, don't you want to make it count? This is like, I want to finish strong, but I have no idea what I want to do. You were called to start your own firm. You knew that you had these talents that you needed to share with the world in a different way. And we're all happy that you did that because, you know, so many people are benefiting from what you do every day and what your teams do. But people to figure that out is hard because I see 100% of my people never know what they want to do, but it's one of two things. It's either I have no idea, but I know I hate this, or I got a hundred ideas. I don't know which one to pick. These are all highly capable, successful, adaptable people, which have many paths available to them. So helping people try and either weed out, you know, and whittle down to the critical few or find that sense of direction in reinventing their career slash identity. And there's some shame in that for some reason. It's like, okay, at this age, I should do what I want to do. The one thing I always hear is like, I don't know what I want to be when I grow up, kind of a, you know, what they say. And I'm like, well, good, because growing up is a trap and you shouldn't do that. So I don't recommend it. But we don't spend time thinking about our career in seasons. And I think we all have seasonality in our career. You know, when I was in my 30s, man, I had something to prove, right? I was a young female leader on Wall Street, full of all these conference room bullies. And I definitely had swagger and something to prove. In my 40s, when I moved into executive roles, now it was about making an impact. It wasn't about me. It was about the impact that we were able to deliver. And now in my 50s, I'm like, you know what? I just want to make a big impact, but I'm not going to be working 14 hours a day anymore. And I'm not going to be feeling like I need to align with corporate values that don't align with me. And the only way I knew how to reset it was, I'm just going to do it myself. So now that's a different season. And I also think in terms of our seasonality, we're able to take different risks at different times. When I was raising my family, my husband was a stay-at-home dad. I couldn't take a lot of risk. I couldn't be an entrepreneur then. God, I got fired once when he was a stay-at-home dad. And I was like, whoo, that's really stressful. <laughs> you know, you're the only one making money. And all of a sudden you get a reorg and you find you're out the door. But later, as she was growing up and he returned to the workforce, now I could take some chances. So then I could move to a smaller bank that had bigger problems to solve. I think embracing the fact that seasonality is okay and that sometimes you've got to hold in a bit and reserve because you're not in a place of risk. But when you can take those risks, when you do, it always works out better. You know, I, I was through three economic downturns in my corporate career. So I was on Wall Street for 9-11. I was in tech during the tech bubble burst. And of course, I was in financial services, you know, during the mortgage crisis. And so I hope this wasn't me, but I was always there. And I always found in my career that while everyone else was hiding under their desks, hoping they didn't get fired, that that's when I was able to make the biggest moves, biggest moves in terms of impact, in terms of accountability, and in terms of compensation. There's all kinds of stuff going on right now. Are we in a recession? Aren't we? What's happening with the economy? We're hearing the tech is like throwing people out the door, you know, by the thousands. And so everybody's really concerned, rightfully so, about what's going on. But this is the best time to search because during chaos, there is always a winner and there's always a loser. And during chaos, there's always opportunity. And that's what I love about these seasons. I love it. I'm like, okay, what's going to happen next, right? That's the most important point. During this VUCA time, there are a lot of people who are just, I like the image of hiding under your desk. And I have worked with people who weren't literally under their desks, but certainly behaviorally under their desks. And they needed to go do something else and create space in the organization for that level of shift that they weren't willing to do, either by wiring or by risk management or tenure, too much to lose. Yeah. And making space for someone who is wired for loving volatility. If you are a big wave surfer, that's different than somebody who goes to uh, the, what are the pools where people do rehab, where you walk against a wave? Yeah. <laughs> it, it is very different walking in a stationary pool 
than jumping on a surfboard, yeah. looking for the adrenaline boost. These are different folks. Now, maybe different seasons in their life, or maybe it's rehab after falling off a surfboard. Both, <laughs> both could be true, but how we're wired and or our mindset also orients us. And as you said, seasonality. If if you're a sole wage earner and a single parent and you've got a few kids at home and a few former spouses you're supporting, that's a different risk profile than someone like me who didn't have children. And so I was able to start a business at an earlier age than some folks can. <laughs> My life just unfolded differently. Yeah. Today we call the people that hide under their desk quiet quitters. That's the big term now is people are quiet quitting. I propose you really quit. <laughs> if you don't like it, then let's, let's find a way to move on to something that you love. That's the other thing too that I think is interesting I think most people don't legitimately believe that you can and must love what you do for a living. I just don't think that that's a fundamental belief amongst most people. It's a job, it's a paycheck, and we move on. But yet because we associate it with our identity all of a sudden when it's not great, let's face it. I mean, I've been through, you know, times where I've been totally in love with my job and I've been through times where every day was just a nightmare. My friends and family suffered. When work was not well, no one was well in my space because I can't put things in a box. I don't think most other people can either. So knowing that this career has such a long range impact on the things and the people that we love the most, it's just surprising to me that people don't put more stock into the fact that you really need to love what you do. Now, I'm not talking about if, you know, if you've got big bills and kids in college and all that kind of fun stuff and you have a philanthropic interest, I'm not saying, you know, go make $30,000 fundraising for your favorite philanthropy, you know, donate the 30 grand instead. But I'm just saying you, you need to get excited about what you do in some way. I always found like when I didn't love what I was doing, I created things that I did love, like either my people or the projects that we worked on or, you know, the chaos that we caused, like. I remember one time I was with Bank of America right after we bought Merrill Lynch. And I was always a front office girl. Ran sales teams for tech and middle office. And like, I'm close to the money. And somehow I ended up in compliance. I'm like, how did that happen? I'm the reason compliance exists. What am I doing here? So, you know, I was just like, it, I just felt like an out of my experience. I was surrounded by, you know, people with low risk profiles and very, very introverted, lots of attorneys. And I'm like, I don't even know what I'm doing here. It was really to help with the regulatory landscape after buying Merrill. Everyone was innocent. All kinds of things were going on. It was kind of helping unwind that. But I, quite frankly, hated the work. It's boring. You know, it's like data privacy and outsourcing. And I'm like, I hate all of this stuff. But you know what I loved? Fixing a really hard problem. I loved the fact that at the time, Bank of America was a US-based company and they had just bought a global organization. They didn't know how to do it. And so I loved having to tell a corporate, no, we're wrong here. You actually have to do it this way because it makes sense in Asia, but then you can't do that in Europe because you're going to go to jail there. And so I loved the complexity. Would I do another spin in compliance? Not willingly. But instead of saying, oh, I got popped someplace that I love, I found and latched on to the biggest, scariest, hardest thing. So that's what I mean about loving what you do right? It's just finding those things that just really fire you up and creating those opportunities for yourself wherever you are. And just, I don't think enough people do that. It's surprising how easy in some cases it is to reframe what we do. I was talking to a group of attorneys about being passionate about your work. Most of them said like, ah, I do real estate transactions or I do whatever. And probably very much like you, they went into the law to do something more compelling and they were more in transactional work. But they were able to say, this affords me the opportunity to give $30,000 to my favorite charity, to put my kids in private schools, to do whatever the thing is that they valued and connecting to other things they cared about and making that very direct link allowed them to be much more passionate about the transactions they were doing. And frankly, the people who were using them for those transactions needed them to care about the transactions because their work was important to the recipient of the work. Maybe it's not passion or love, but at least engagement is really important for the individual to find joy. And you said being a decent family member even. And for the enterprise, our clients expect us to care about them and the things we do for them. This whole concept of employee engagement, 
scores have been terrible for decades, right? Every year it's like, okay, new, new survey, new task force, new everything, same result. It's so interesting to me because I think we're asking the wrong question. Instead of how do you believe the company is doing X, Y, Z, right? In terms of the, the employee engagement, I think the better question is if you could do something that lit you up every day, what would it be? And then making sure they have the opportunity to do that at least some of the time. And it would be a very simple one question survey. And then, you know, having that agility that we talked about, having that ability to, you know, again, let's be controversial with the whole internal gig economy, right? You know, we have intrapreneurship. So why can't we have intra gig economy? And just really letting people step into the things that light them up. The other thing, and I know I felt victim of this as a leader a lot, is when you're moving fast and you've got big things that are on your plate and everyone is stressed and everyone is cranky and all that kind of fun stuff, you get to the point where you just need to get things done. But what you forget to do is you forget to talk to your people about the why. And if you don't connect why, if you don't connect the sense of a purpose, if you don't connect the so what to what you're doing, then people are going to check out. Because if it doesn't matter, then why should it matter to them, right? Do you see that too? Yeah, absolutely. And this is where some of the generational stuff comes in, I think, that our younger folks are more committed to impact and value and values than some of our greatest generation and boomers. So young folks need to see that connection more than people who are my seniors. For some folks, that's just not necessarily what lights them up. Right. It's not optional anymore. Drawing that direct line, if we have younger employees, is crucial. And it doesn't hurt with our more senior employees either. You know, let's talk about these more senior employees. They are in a position to make a difference. Whether they're in official leadership or not, if they've like, you're, you know, the client you talked about were average 10 years, 20 years. I guarantee you, if you ask them, how many things do you do every day that make no sense? They would have a list of like that there are, right? But yet nobody's saying, we should stop doing this. So the people who are in a position to change or at least advocate for change to connect it to the why or to say, let's stop doing this because it actually doesn't make any sense, that initiative's not there. And whether it's you don't feel like you're going to be heard if you elevate those things or leaders are just so used to the way we've always done things. That drive me crazy when I heard that, by the way. Every time I heard that, I was like nails on a chalkboard. So, but there's this inertia in terms of how the work gets done, what work gets done. And most of it, quite frankly, if you had green build, throw away, start over again, wouldn't still exist. And so while the older generation may not need the why, I think we all do to some extent, but we need to matter. And you're making the case that if I'm doing something either that I love, but I don't love the environment. So you may have loved Wall Street, but you were in a company that didn't operate the way you preferred or a boss that was just misaligned with you. The ability to pivot is foundational. Absolutely. I mean, during my career, I've made five different industry changes throughout the financial services ecosystem tech and banking and finance and all these other things, but I've also made 11 different career changes from sales to audit and everything in between. And so I think just being able to reinvent yourself. And I, I love the fact that this younger generation isn't tolerating typical corporate behavior. If I don't see the value, if I don't have a career path, if I don't have a voice, I'm leaving. And they do right? Versus suck it up, buttercup. This is how it is. Like that doesn't work anymore. So eventually that will, well, two things are going to happen. They're going to become the bosses and they'll fix it or they'll continue to leave enough. And there's not going to be enough people to bring that back over time to where they're going to have to change ultimately. But I love that they're forcing that issue in terms of, I'm not going to accept this. I just wish everybody did because it would just force the change that we need, the innovation and the adaptability within organizations that is needed desperately. What's one of the biggest challenges people, especially leaders, face during career change? For some reason, people believe that to do something I've not done, that for some reason, all the skills I had before don't count anymore. Okay, so if I did this in this industry, oh, but I never did that in this industry. So none of it counts. And I got to start from the beginning. And for very confident people, this is one of the low confidence moments. 
in terms of who's going to hire me? Am I too old? Can I make the money that I need? Like all of those things. I have a saying that I use with my clients that I believe just sits at the bottom of my core here and that your skills are collateral. Think of it as money. And every skill that you have is what you're going to use to buy your next role. But we don't really keep track of what we do or we discount what we do because it's been a long time. I'm not an expert. I didn't actually do the work. You know, somebody else did on my team. And so we don't take credit for all of the things that we've done. And for most of us that have been at it for 30 years, let's face it, it's getting a little old. So we're not sure. Let's see if it counts. And so with this idea that what I did before, it doesn't count. And the lack of discipline in really treating your skills like an asset. And I'd ask my clients, I'm like, I bet you, you can tell me within striking distance, what's in your financial portfolio right now? It makes most of our hearts break. We don't want to look because, you know, it's been sad lately. But you can do that. I'm like, but if I say, all right, I want to see your top 50 skills. What are they? I was like, humana, humana, humana. No idea. And so we need to start to be more proactive in taking credit for the things that we do. Look under every sofa cushion, under the car seat, like everything to find these skills, metaphorically speaking, and really take credit and command for those things. Because when you do, then there's a process that I use with my clients, which is interesting, in that we take the industry out of it. So for example, let's say you're in a highly regulated industry, so financial services, healthcare, you know, you name it, and you're used to working in a regulatory environment with their regulators and alphabet soup. They've got a million regulations are all over the place. But if you want to pivot, you feel like, oh, well, I don't know anything about their regulations in this new environment. But the reality is you know how to function in a regulatory environment. You weren't born learning alphabet soup. That was learned. That's not a natural skill. That's understanding laws and how to navigate. Guess what? Most government officials walk the same way. So we lose the ability to understand what will transfer into the new areas that we want to go to and command top dollar for it. Instead of saying, I got to learn, please be patient. It's like, no, I own this. And not only am I going to be able to do this, I'm bringing all these other skills that I just found. That transition is just feeling like what I do doesn't count. And that kills your confidence. It kills how you show up. Because if you don't believe it, how are you going to get anybody else to? Right. So you've got to really be in that. I'm a rock star. I'm in my, I got my mojo and I'm going. You know, when I changed consulting focus from some of the business process reengineering kind of stuff to human change management and human capital, I didn't know anything about that. I didn't realize how much I didn't know anything about that. And yet nobody knew I didn't know because I knew how to learn and I knew how to not look terrified all the time. It was amazing how people had confidence in me more so than I had in myself and that I was still able to deliver. So it wasn't like I came in, I scammed people and they paid me and I didn't do the work. It was all the things that got me here and learning quickly allowed me to pivot into a role for which I was very qualified, a consulting firm to consulting firm. So I understood consulting and I understood a whole bunch of other stuff. But this big piece of the work we did, I didn't have the expertise and was able to get there very quickly. And to your point, I was worried when I started the search that I was going to have to take a pay cut and you know all the things we tell ourselves. Turned out I didn't. And consulting covers a myriad of career ADD. Yep. You know, for those of us who want to do all kinds of things that we aren't yet totally expert in, I've worked with all kinds of industries, to your point, with all kinds of functions. And when I started with any of them, I didn't know anything about making steel or manufacturing paper or, you know, list the things. But the industry expertise wasn't the primary focus of the role I was filling. I was matched with people who understood that. So the other part for me was knowing where it was okay to not be an expert. I didn't have to place false limitations on myself that blocked me from entering a door. And that's a journey that so many people go through. And I loved how you said, you know, career ADD, because I jokingly say you only have to be 10 minutes smarter than the person you're talking to. You don't have to be an expert to help. You have to be further along on your journey, but there's always people who are just getting started in companies, in whatever. And so a lot of the people that I work with that are in, let's say, mid-leadership levels in big, big companies that want to step up and take a bigger role, I'm like, downsize the organization. Because what you've done in this multi-billion dollar publicly traded company 
in your space is equivalent, if not more, than a C-suite role in a mid-sized company. And just think of the value that you can bring in helping them mature their operations, rethink about their sales and business development, product development, or whatever the case may be. So, so I think there's always a place for us to thrive as leaders. And I think moving in terms of industries or moving, we're in organizations in this life cycle. Some people love startups. I've got a lot of my clients that spend time working with VC firms and helping protect the assets of the companies that they've invested in. So fractional COO, CFO, that kind of stuff. That's fun because you've got a VC firm that just invested a couple million dollars into this company. And now you get to oversee that as a COO and that's part of your job, but they've had just bought 10 companies. So you're kind of the COO over all of them. And so there's a lot of different ways that you can go into either a fractional, full-time or portfolio type career that is energizing, highly compensated and a lot less stressful than sometimes running the day-to-day yourself. That I think reinforces your comment about seasonality. Mm-hmm. Early in my career, there were things I needed to do. Yeah. And I believe everyone needs to build skills, build confidence, build a resume. And then we have different choices to move into leadership, move into consulting, move into entrepreneurship. We mature in that space. Then we have additional opportunities to be the sages and the wise ones we hope we have the opportunities to be the, yeah. the wise ones because we hope we're wise. Um, I'm like, I don't want to be the smartest one in the room, right? But uh, yeah. But I want to play a role where I get to share my wisdom with people. Absolutely. 100%. That gets back to impact too, right? Where we all just want to make a difference and make that impact. You know, I also think for people who are about 10 to 15 years away from retirement, most of us don't want to just pull the plug go to the beach, drink Mai Tais all day. There's this concept of a soft retirement. When you're thinking about the last couple of moves that you're going to make, because I always tell people think in five-year terms, you know, don't think that your next move is your last move because if you've got more than 10 years, it's not going to be, you know, either by your choice or by someone else's. It's just not how things play anymore. But you want to think about what do you want to do in your soft retirement? Do you want to do board work? Do you want to, you know, participate in academics? Do you want to help entrepreneurial companies and endeavors find their way in the world? There's so many things that our skills as leaders are highly sought after. But if you wait till you need to do that, it's late. You know, there's too much of a lag time. So you're really going to want to think about, okay, I've got about a five-year trajectory where I need to start to lay that groundwork for board work, academics, understanding, you know, how to get involved with entrepreneurial incubators or things like that. So I really encourage people to think a few steps down in terms of, okay, this is good, but how is this going to, if I've got choices, which many of us do if we choose to take them, which one is going to set me up best for what I want to do in my soft retirement? If you're in an organization that won't let you uh, do public speaking or do this or do that, then that's probably not going to be a great fit for you if that's the stuff that you want to do in your soft retirement. So those are some things to think about. I want to bring up one other subject that's tough for leaders to talk about. And I assume you talk a lot about it, that when people either make mistakes that cause them to be exited or they're exited just based on business conditions. So you said my company was acquired. I was no longer necessary. They got rid of our function or our business unit or the hundreds of thousands of people who are exited. I think the latest statistic I read is 47% of executives are let go at some point in time and a whole bunch more make mistakes that feel to them, whether or not they're seen externally as catastrophic. How do you help people think about reframing their career, especially if they are feeling like they have career leprosy. I lost my job. I feel like everyone sees me in my underwear. Everyone knows all of my flaws and I can't even walk out of my house to walk the dog today. Most leaders, whether or not they've been exited, have had some misstep that they feel like people can see it like it's a physical defect. I think we have this misguided belief that a lot more people pay attention to us than really do. (laughs) I hate to break it to you, but nobody's paying attention, right? So we'd love to think that, oh, this is a big deal, but it's not. I know personally, I've always learned more from my failures than I have from my successes. 
And it's the resilience that we're talking about in terms of how do you fail forward? Because this concept that failure is bad, I think it's completely off base. I fundamentally believe that failure is a critical part of success and that you cannot succeed if you haven't failed. And the bigger screw up you make, you learn. And you're never going to do that again, guaranteed, right? Because you, you always want to make new mistakes. They're more fun. You know how the old mistakes set. So you want to do new ones. But I think that's that mindset is that this yin and yang of failure and success is in our heads. No one has a quote unquote perfect career path. Everyone has screwed up in varying degrees of magnitude, but everyone has. And no one is paying attention to you nearly as much as you think they are. And so this is very, very much a personal torture device more than a public issue that you need to deal with. And so it's a lot more internal work. If you can show how you failed forward, it's like, yep, I got fired, I made a mistake, and now I'm using that mistake to make sure no one else makes it, and now we're successful beyond belief, right? If you think, oh, okay, this is a smaller mistake, but we're going to know next time we're going to do it better, different, faster, smarter, whatever. So, you know, I really think that this self-shaming for failure is a mindset issue more than anything else. I love the idea of the yin and yang of failure and success. If you're not taking risks and trying new things, you're not doing new things. And if you're not doing new things in this world, in this current, very volatile, changing environment, you're probably going to be obsolete before you get fired or you'll be obsolete and fired. 100% agree with you. Absolutely. Yeah. Which is just an interesting caution for all of us as leaders to be thinking about how do I create grace for myself as I'm navigating this change? Yes, absolutely. Let's wrap up with one of your favorite client success stories. I was working with a client who was very much in that space that you just talked about, actually. Had had a few missteps in multiple roles. You know how there's certain people that just pick the wrong people to date? Yeah, I was one of those. <laughs> he was always picking the wrong people to work for, but it was always his fault for some reason, right? I'm like, okay, you can tell the core skills, the executive presence, you know, because he was one of those people where he was riding high, got hit, and just kept going down and down and down, right? And so it was very, very hard for him to really kind of get his mojo back. And so we did a lot of work unpacking the mess and really looking at high demand, short supply, all that kind of fun stuff. But he'd always been in finance. And so ultimately what he was able to do is to move into an executive role in a medical marijuana company. And it was like a completely different pivot. Medical marijuana industry is very heavily female oriented. So the kindness, if you will, was in the industry. But he just found his jam there. And it was great to see that this career financial guy where the system was his biggest asset and his biggest nemesis to get out of that and to move into something that was totally different that he loved and that loved him back. So that's one of my favorite stories. Thank you so much, Tammy. How do people reach you? Hopefully soon you're going to be on our website as if you've always been there. But how else do people reach you? Okay. Easiest place to get me, and I'm sure they'll be in the show notes as well, is you can look me up on LinkedIn, Tammy Alvarez at Career Winner Circle, or you can hit us up on our website, which is careerwinnercircle.com. So those are the easiest places to find us. Thank you. Thank you. How much fun. Thank you.